first off, please welcome Dr. Fiona Hill and Congressman Adam Schiff. And now we're going to jump into some questions. So we're going to, this question is, is for both of you and um, maybe I'll have Dr. Hill go first. Uh, so if we go back to the 2019 congressional hearings when, when, uh, when you testified um, and answered questions from Congressman Schiff uh, during the Trump impeachment hearings, and obviously Congressman Schiff went on to be the lead manager, how did that experience change your life, uh, the life of the country, and uh, how important was it in your decision to write this book? Well, first of all, thank you very much uh, for inviting me here. It's a great honor to be here with Congressman Schiff and with the mayor. Um, <laughs> unexpected, but actually a really wonderful privilege. I'm a neighbor. Um, I live in Bethesda, um, so Gaithersburg is my neighborhood as well, so I wouldn't miss this for the world. And really thrilled to be with everyone here from Gaithersburg. <laughs> Proud of the part of Gaithersburg. To answer the first, uh, well, the last bit of your question first, I mean, it was really as a result of that experience at the first impeachment trial that I decided to write this book. Um, as I said um, in my opening statement um, at the impeachment hearings, I'm an American by choice. I'm a naturalized citizen. I mean, I've lived in the United States much longer than I've lived anywhere else in my life. I came to the U.S. in 1989, um, initially coming uh, to Boston. And I would never have expected, just to be really honest, the twists and turns in US politics that I've experienced over all of this time that I've been here. I came uh, to the United States, you know, seeing before me the land of opportunity, a land where anyone, uh, no matter what their background, uh, could get ahead. That's certainly been the case for me. And also, I'm in a country that was incredibly welcoming. And I'll just say very frankly that when I first got here, I had absolutely no idea about anybody's political background. It wasn't like the first people I met said, you know, hey, I'm Sue, I'm a Democrat, or hey, I'm Bob and a Republican. It was just, you know, basically everyone was an American. There was obviously differentiation among the people that I met, and I loved that. I loved the fact that people came from absolutely everywhere and were involved in a shared endeavor. I really bought into the whole preamble of we the people and trying to make a perfect union. It was one of the reasons that I wanted to stay. The other reason that I really wanted to stay here in the United States was 9-11. Because I'd grown up in the United Kingdom during the troubles uh, with Northern Ireland. And for those of you, you know, who know something about that, we experienced in Great Britain the largest sustained terrorist bombing campaign in history. More than 70,000 improvised explosive devices you know, going on um, around uh, the mainland of Britain and also in Ireland itself where you know, it was pretty devastating. And no matter what your views are about Irish independence or the nationalist cause, I mean, clearly this terrorism was completely unacceptable. It ripped families apart, including my own, because I, had a lot of, I have also Irish uh, relatives on you know, both sides of those divides. And I was really struck by how devastating 9-11 was going to be, and it already was for uh, the United States. I mean, I still can't think about it without tearing up. A very good friend's father was in the first plane. There was lots of other people you know, that I knew were, that were deeply affected by all of this. And I really felt then at the time that I wanted to give something you know, back to the country that was giving me so much. I became a citizen, and I tried to find out you know, ways of serving. Now, um, I mean, I'm, I'm a policy wonk, so you know, there are limits <laughs> to some of the things. I didn't think about running for elected office because I wasn't sure what I could bring to the table. But I did think that I could offer you know, something on national security. And so in every administration that I've served, it's been very much on the focus, uh, focused on being a non-partisan expert on national security issues. And that was in the spirit in which I joined uh, the Trump administration in 2017. The Russians had basically interfered in our election. It was clear to me from previous jobs that they were doing that to completely upset our faith in our electoral system and to destroy uh, basically the institution of the US presidency so that we'd all have doubts in it. And I thought that when I joined the administration to work with people that I'd worked with before when I'd been in the National Intelligence uh, Council, that everybody would realize the national security imperative of this and that we needed to pull together because here was Russia trying to stoke divisions. Well, as we all know, that wasn't quite how it all turned out. And when I got to uh, the um, impeachment hearings um, as a fact witness, um, as Congressman um, Schiff will already remember, I'd had the experience of the closed door 
depositions before then, that was the first time that I had met you, although according to conspiracy theories, we'd been together on several occasions before <laughs> then, but that was certainly the only time in real life that we actually, uh, actually met. And I was really struck very sadly by how for many members of Congress, this is a game, this is a political game. Whereas for me, again, as a naturalized citizen who had to take civics classes and you know, uh, give an oath to the Constitution and then another oath when I got my job, this was part of you know, basically what I'd signed up for, uh, congressional oversight. It's part of our representative democracy. And I was just very shocked by the parties on infighting, the political performances that I saw there that had no bearing on the seriousness of uh, the issue. And as a result of being kind of put on the spot behind uh, closed doors, very clear that people were trying to discredit me and all of my colleagues who'd been subpoenaed and asked to step up, cast aspersions on our patriotism, our dedication to the United States, particularly my colleagues, uh, Ambassador Maria Yovanovitch and Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, who were both naturalized uh, from Eastern Europe. I mean, I'm naturalized uh, obviously from the United Kingdom, but questions about dual loyalties which I didn't quite get in the same, uh, the same measure. And I felt like I needed to speak out in the opening statement. And as a result of the response to that, and the great concerns that people expressed to me in letters, and I'm sure you had the same um, thing, along with all the death threats and the other things that you undoubtedly you know, got with being uh, the impeachment uh, manager there, I felt that I needed to try to explain how I had figured out what had happened, how we'd got to this terribly polarized place. Because as you said um, in the introduction to me, I saw a lot of parallels from my own life, from growing up in the deindustrialized north of England, which is just like Appalachia or the old American Rust Belt, from seeing these twists and turns in Russian um, uh, modern uh, development, seeing the rise of Vladimir Putin as a populist president, and then seeing the similar developments here. I thought about a way that I could put it all together and respond to some of the letters where people had said, how did we get here? So that was how I got to writing the book. Congressman Schiff. Um, well, you want me to repeat the question? I, no, I, I, uh, um, I was just wondering if maybe if I held it, would it would that be better? Okay. Yeah, it's probably um, a good idea. Uh, I have a, a lot of experience with malfunctioning microphones <laughs> over the years. Um, uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you uh, so much for moderating today, and uh, thank you all for coming and. Uh, we apologize for the heat. It was the mayor's doing, and um, we, we tried to warn him last night, but he wouldn't, wouldn't listen to us. Um, but what a great honor to be uh, on the stage with Dr. Hill. Isn't she absolutely brilliant? Um, Dr. Hill informed me last night that uh, some time ago on social media, they had uh, taken her head and put it on my wife's shoulders. Uh, so apparently we were married in, yeah. in only the way you can be on social media. Um, <laughs> but my real wife is here, Eve. I wanted to introduce Eve. Um, so uh, if, if the question is how, how did the, the hearings and the experience change my life, um, you know, as you mentioned in, in the opening description, I think those who had known me in the public uh, and uh, among my colleagues in Congress, if you a had asked uh, in the years prior to Donald Trump, and I've been in Congress now over 20 years, uh, who is the most likely candidate for um, liberal lightning rod, it would not have been me. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, and I still don't view myself as particularly partisan. But I also um, viewed the former president as a grave danger to our democracy. Uh, and if that put me in the role of seeming to be a partisan, then I would take whatever role it required uh, to do the job and defend our institutions. Uh, and I, I think that our system really depends on two healthy functioning political parties. Uh, right now, we only have one. Uh, the Republican Party under the former president has devolved into a kind of an anti-truth, anti-democratic cult of personality. And as long as that is the case, and that party is out using the same big lie that led to the insurrection on January 6th to usher in a new generation of Jim Crow laws, uh, to attack independent, local, meritocratic elections officials, uh, to try to use the infrastructure of a democracy against itself, uh, then I, I feel an obligation to do what I can to defend our institutions. And 
but it was certainly quite a dramatic change uh, to um, be repeatedly singled out by the President of the United States uh, personally and uh, in, in the most ad, ad hominem fashion. Um, I'll tell you a quick story of sort of what it was like personally. Um, the first time the President attacked me on Twitter, it was sleazy Adam Schiff, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And my son was then 13, he was at camp, and the nice thing about camp is they take away your electronics. <laughs> and so when Eve and I went to pick him up, uh, we hoped that he wouldn't have heard it from anyone else and, and we wanted to tell him. In a normal world, it'd be kind of a big deal to be called sleazy by the President of the United States. Um, it ended up becoming quite routine, but in a, at that time it was pretty extraordinary. So we went to pick up my son and I, I said, Eli, something happened while you were at camp, it's not a big deal but I wanted you to hear it from me. The President of the United States called your father sleazy. Uh, and he paused for a moment uh, as he processed what did that mean. And then he looked up and he said, can I call you sleazy? Uh, to which I replied, well, only if you want me to call you sleazy junior. Um, and we figured he was gonna be okay. Uh, but uh, but I, you know, just to add on to what uh, Dr. Hill was saying, um, she and other witnesses who came and testified in the Ukraine investigation. They were nonpartisans. They were career diplomats. They were former and current National Security Council officials. Uh, they were as nonpartisan as nonpartisan can be. They were experts and are experts in their field. And I, uh, you know, I, I had seen uh, Dr. Hill testify in the deposition and I knew how brilliant she was just from that experience. She then came into the hearing room and began her remarks, as I recall, um, by debunking the myth that some of my colleagues were pushing, that it was Ukraine that interfered in the 2016 election, not Russia. Uh, and she informed our committee that this was a Russian narrative. Uh, and would we please stop, that is some of the members of the committee stop uh, articulating this, this narrative, which was destructive uh, of our national security. Well, you might imagine how that went over with some of my colleagues who had been advocating exactly that. Uh, they then went after her. And here's where you got to really see the brilliance. Uh, as in my view, uh, she uh, walked circles around them uh, and, and did so, again, in a completely nonpartisan fashion. Uh, and watching her, watching Marie Ivanovich and Alexander Vindman and Bill Taylor and David Holmes and others, I was glad that the country got to see the quality of people uh, in government service. The, the, the people... <laughs> people who had been demonized as the deep state, but were in fact great patriots, uh, who demonstrated incredible courage and came forward uh, and did their lawful duty uh, when subpoenaed to testify. And, so it, it uh, was wonderful to, uh, to behold and uh, uh, certainly uh, had um, formed a, a, a lifelong appreciation for, for you and, and others who answered the call of duty. Thank you. Congressman Schiff, um, you describe your book as the story of how good people were persuaded to abandon their beliefs and ideology, their dedication to something larger than themselves. Why do people abandon long-held beliefs in political life, and how can they recapture them? Well, it's a great question, and, and part of why I wanted to write the book is that there had been a lot written about what was taking place in the Trump administration, in the White House, during those years, but there had been relatively little at the time written about what happened under the Capitol Dome. And the reality is that Donald Trump could not have succeeded in tearing down our institutions in such a dramatic fashion, uh, with, with such remarkable speed, had he not had willing accomplices and enablers in the Congress. Uh, and I marveled at how I saw people that I knew and respected, because I believed that they believed what they were saying. Turned out they didn't believe it at all. Uh, or if they did believe it, none of it mattered quite so much as their own ambition. And I, and I wanted to write about how does that happen. And 
what I discovered was something that the, histor the historian Robert Caro once said in an interview. He said that power doesn't corrupt as much as it reveals. It doesn't always reveal us for our best, our best but it says a lot about who we are. Uh, and over these years, uh, power revealed a lot about the people I serve with. Um, in some cases, it was a, a surprise. Uh, you know, in the case of the least of Stefanics that modeled themselves as a moderate, but turned out to be nothing of the sort. Now, I suspect that in the case of the Elise Stephanics, they have always been who they were. Uh, it, they were just never tested. Uh, their, their devotion to their country, their constitution, their oath of office was never put up against their oath of office. And when it was, they were found lacking. Others, like Liz Cheney, uh, Adam Kinzinger, were found to be people of great courage and character. Uh, and, and so I think it's less that these folks that I've worked with changed so much as they were revealed. Um, and by the way, and this was one of the most awful realizations for me of January 6th, uh, as we saw these uh, Confederate flags and Auschwitz t-shirts come parading through the Capitol, uh, the last several years have revealed a lot about our country as well, uh, about a deep, deep vein of bigotry that runs through the country since its founding. Uh, and, and this is something that we also have to confront. Um, but in terms of how do we, um, how do we move forward from here, uh, I, I think that it really requires us as citizens to, um, to do a better job discerning the character of those that we elect to office. Uh, because the, my takeaway from two impeachments where the evidence was quite overwhelming in both and where in the second, the jury literally had to run for their lives. Uh, they were percipient witnesses in the most visceral of ways and it still wasn't enough. My takeaway is it doesn't matter how beautifully our constitution is written, doesn't matter how tightly drafted our laws may be to confine the worst of human nature. Um, if people don't give meaning to their oath, if they don't give uh, give content to it with ideas of right and wrong, if they are unwilling to accept the basic truth, none of it works. Uh, and so at the end of the day, it, it all comes back to us as citizens uh, in making sure that we, we um, look for character in who we elect, not, not identity of policy positions so much as, as character. Thank you. Dr. Hill, um, we're going to get to a slightly different theme, but an important theme in your book, which is the diminishing, as you say, infrastructure of opportunity uh, in American life. And you linked it to the decline that you saw in your hometown in England. Um, tell us about the infrastructure of opportunity and how can it be strengthened? Yeah, we really are getting uh, microphonically challenged here, but I think I just invented a new objective. Um, I'd like to just um, try to link um, that question to uh, what Congressman Schiff has just said. Because one of the, think the reasons that we've got such a breakdown in you know, people's feelings about democracy is uh, a lack of a feeling of participation on some people's part. Now, I think you're absolutely right about um, you know, some of your colleagues, uh, sadly, in Congress and others that we've seen who, you know, certainly put their own positions and power above everything else. But many of the people who we saw, not all of them, but many of the people get themselves engaged in uh, the atrocious events of January 6th were in part looking for kind of some new sense of belonging. In many respects, people feel that their representation is no longer there. And it is based, as you said, on senses of identity and you know, how they see themselves reflected just literally, figuratively, in um, uh, the people around them or the people that are in, they're in office. But other times, it's people feeling that they don't have a stake in society. And that's where the infrastructure of opportunity comes in. And you're doing it right now. I mean, this is an incredible opportunity by creating community 
uh, organisations and community activities to bring people in, give them opportunity to meet other people in their community. Local authors, you know, for example, I was just walking around and having a look at all of the great books that uh, people are producing, being able to convey their ideas and uh, engage in, you know, direct conversation with everyone through a book or in, uh, in real life uh, like this. And it's all part of our ongoing sense of education, education about ourselves, testing who we are, but education about our society. And I mean, I think that's obviously why we wrote books as well, to convey the things that we'd learned, the things that have been evident to us, and the reasons um, in which you know, we've all found ourselves in the positions that we are right now, or that the country's in right now. And I benefited immensely when I was a kid as the child of a coal mine, and my father uh, lost his job over and over and over again because the coal mines were closing down in the northeast of England, just like they are you know, all the way around the United States. Coal, no matter what Senator Manchin in West Virginia you know, may think, is not going to come back as a long-term proposition. And all the way around the world, you know, given with climate change, there's a major transition underway. And in the north of England, where I was growing up, coal was mined from the beginning by the Romans. I mean, we're going back millennia of coal mining here, and it was eventually, you know, <laughs> things are going to shift. And in the 1960s was really when the mines started to close down, just as uh, I was born and came along. And my father, like many other coal miners of his generation, he was 14 when he left school to go down the coal mines, basically in um, 1946, so just right at the end of uh, World War II. All of his education was just geared towards pushing him into a coal mine. In fact, his parents just said, you know, why bother with schooling? You're just going to go down the mine, Alf. He himself had wanted an education. So I grew up, you know, under that knowledge that my father hadn't had the opportunity for an education, that he was being pushed in a certain direction. And if I had the opportunity for an, an education, I should take it. And there was also that sense that education was a lifelong pursuit, just like, you know, we're, we're doing here. We're engaging in self-education and, and group education, community education. And that there had to be you know, some ways uh, of being able to access that. My father you know, spent his whole life still being a coal miner, even though for probably the best part of his working life, when he became a porter in a local hospital, an orderly in the hospital, he was doing something else. But it was such a strong identity because it came from community. So the mining villages that my dad grew up in, everything was uh, basically linked to the mines. But the miners did what you did. They pooled their resources and they created these welfare societies and they might involve literary circles. People like George Orwell came and took part in uh, conversations and lectures with the miners, uh, for example. George Orwell's book about the road to Wigan Pier is all about the time that he spent uh, with uh, the coal miners of uh, the north of England. They created artist circles and some really famous artists emerged out of uh, the coal mining uh, regions. Uh, sports, uh, most of uh, the British uh, soccer players in the 1960s were all ex-coal miners, some of the most sort of famous of uh, the time, the David Beckhams of their time were all former coal miners. And they also put a lot of money into the education um, of their children and also of their members. And my first grant to go and study Russian came from the miners' union, but bizarrely, from some money that was given to them by the miners of the Donbass, which is one of the reasons why I've ended up being so interested in Ukraine today. Because my uh, area was twinned with the Donbass going back to the 1920s. In fact, the Donbass was built up by Western industrialists, not by Russian industrialists, back in the 1880s and 1890s. In fact, Donetsk, one of the cities that's being pounded right now, used to be called Huzovka, after a Mr. Hughes from North Wales, who was the industrialist who first sank the deep mines and built up the steelworks there, and took a bunch of Welsh and Scottish and Irish and English miners to work there. And in the 1920s, the miners of County Durham, who had only just got the vote and had built up their own Pitman's Parliament to give themselves a voice and to participate in creating an infrastructure of opportunity for themselves, went on a bunch of study trips, sometimes led by the miners' wives themselves, who you know, at that point had only just uh, got the vote, to see if there was something that they could learn uh, from uh, miners of the Donbass. Uh, because of you know, this, uh, then the myth of self-representation, because this was the beginning of the Soviet period. They actually came back convinced anti-communists, uh, many of them, and decided to try to root communism out from among their body because they saw it as being repressive rather than trying to create opportunity over time. But during the miners' strike in the UK of 1984, miners of the Donbass from their associations, not from the KGB as one might have assumed, raised money from the mi for the miners of uh, County Durham because of this long solidarity going back decades. 
And I was given this as a study grant to go to study Russian for a summer so that I could then um, go to college and study Russian. And that's all part of that creating infrastructure of opportunity. And I wrote about this in the book because I think it's something that we've been losing here. We wait for the state to do everything. I mean, you've been grappling in Congress with all the infrastructure bills and build back better. But there's an awful lot of things that communities can do. And I worry you know, a lot that part of our problem today is that people have lost the community spirit. And as you said yesterday, and you know, I'm sure you'll say in your closing remarks, Gaithersburg is one of the most diverse communities in the United States. And I, and I can see this you know, looking around. People have come from everywhere. And we've all shared, um, we've got a, a shared mission together of building a better community. And so we need to rebuild our larger community by starting at the bottom of the grassroots. So you're already doing it in terms of into bringing back the infrastructure of opportunity. De Tocqueville wrote about this. Uh, Congressman Schiff and many of his colleagues have been speaking about this. And the only way we're going to basically revitalize the problems that we've got at the top is to start with all of us here. So I'm just really glad to be here again. I will just point out that Dr. Hill has made the case that I've made a lot of times out of how a great book festival can change the world. And she said it just like I scripted it for her. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you very much. That's a, that's a tremendous compliment. Um, uh, Ukraine has occupied a greater portion of your atten attention in recent years than you probably imagined it ever would. Uh, first in the impeachment trial, um, and now as the U.S. Uh, aids Ukrainians' efforts to defend themselves against the Russian invasion. You recently traveled to Ukraine, um, and I was curious about what your impressions were of how that war is going. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, um, I, uh, as we sat down with President Zelensky um, in Kiev, I guess now two weeks ago, I had to keep reminding myself uh, that this was the same President Zelensky that Donald Trump tried to shake down. Um, and what was particularly striking to me about it was um, to remember that up until a few years ago, uh, Vladimir Zelensky was a sitcom comedian playing a sitcom comedian who becomes the president of his country <laughs> in an illustration of life imitating art to the most bizarre degree. Um, and, but, but part of what was so striking about that was that in that really first major interaction with the President of the United States. Um, he, they had had a perfunctory phone call of congratulations some months before that, but in his first meaningful interaction with the President of the United States, what happens but the President of the United States tries to shake him down? In a conversation where even then he was asking for javelins, you might recall, uh, because even then Ukrainians were fighting and dying at the hands of Russians and Russian-backed separatists, at the rate of every week, sometimes every day. Now, it wasn't the intense warfare we're seeing now, but nonetheless, it was a hot war. Uh, he was in desperate need of support from the most important ally. Uh, and what happens, the President of the United States says, well, you know, uh, he wants this favor. Uh, and the favor, of course, is to smear his opponent, uh, Joe Biden. And looking at him across the table, I wondered what he must have thought of the United States in that moment. Um, to see something so at odds with what our country was supposed to stand for. Um, and, and the other thing that was so striking given his background was the incredible command of the battlefield that he demonstrated in our meeting. We sat down with him for about three hours. Uh, we went over how the war had changed uh, in the last few months uh, from a uh, early phase where Russian forces were well dispersed uh, as the Russians tried to encircle Kyiv uh, to, because of uh, remarkable Ukrainian resistance, having to um, withdraw from the north, consolidate uh, their military effort in the south and the east. Uh, and the fighting had moved from very close in fighting where Ukrainians could ambush Russian troops and material uh, to um, fighting at a greater distance uh, where the needs uh, the Ukraine had were different. Uh, more long-range artillery, more multiple launch rocket systems, um, and, and so he, he displayed a, a, an extraordinary command of the battlefield, an extraordinary calm under fire, uh, and, uh, and of course the effort that Ukraine has made 
taking on uh, one of the world's most powerful militaries has been nothing short of extraordinary. Uh, now, I also have to say I view this conflict much from the perspective of the chair of intelligence, and I think the Biden administration has really done something quite unique and important in the use of its intelligence, uh, and that is even before the war began, uh, declassifying intelligence about just what Putin was planning, uh, that this would be a massive invasion, not a minor incursion, that there would be an effort to encircle Kyiv and install a puppet regime. Uh, and if you'll recall at the time before the war began, many of our allies didn't believe us. Uh, indeed, Vladimir Zelensky didn't believe us. Um, but when Russian plans and intentions and our intelligence about them proved to be so prescient, um, it had the effect, I think, of uh, allowing the administration to galvanize our NATO allies and our other allies into some of the most punitive sanctions uh, ever imposed and within record speed. Uh, so I think it had a very important impact. Likewise, the administration's disclosure about potential Russian false flag operations involving chemical and biological weapons serve as an important deterrent. Uh, and more than that, I have been urging the administration that to the degree we see China uh, intervene either militarily to support Russia or to help Russia evade sanctions, we ought to also declassify information about that so that President Xi understands uh, that if he gets involved helping the Russians, uh, he can do so, but he will not do so clandestinely, and the world will see that he has Ukrainian blood on his hands. Uh, now, in terms of where the conflict is likely to go from here, uh, and, and Dr. Hill is the real expert, um, I have been asking that question of our intel agencies since even before the war began, and the difficulty is that Putin's ambitions are both at odds with his capabilities, but also uh, involve very dramatic miscalculations that he made before the war began, uh, about the kind of resistance he was likely to face, about the kind of leader Zelensky would be, about the degree to which the United States and NATO would come together. Uh, the, the idea now that Finland and Sweden might become part of NATO, if that happens, um, it is a strategic defeat of the first order for Putin. Uh, so Putin has nevertheless staked everything on this. He is not looking for an exit ramp. Um, and Russia has a history of doing very poorly at the outbreak of war, but overcoming difficulty by throwing massive amounts of men and munitions at a problem. Uh, and so there is nothing predetermined about the outcome here. Uh, although it does look tragically like we're entering into the beginning of a potentially long war of attrition. And, and I do think what we can do to help Ukraine and to help bring this conflict to an end sooner than later is to give Ukraine all the material support that we can, uh, short of anything that would lead us into a direct confrontation between the US or NATO and Russia, um, but also continuing to strengthen sanctions on Russia uh, so that ultimately the Russian people see the folly uh, of what their dictator has done. Uh, and I wish I had a better prescription for a shorter end, but, uh, but there is so much at stake. Uh, and one final point I'll, I'll make, uh, I keep coming back to an image from the beginning of the war in which you see a Russian tank um, uh, and a Ukrainian man throw himself in front of that tank. And the tank stops and then lurches forward and then stops again and you just marvel at the courage of this Ukrainian man to throw his entire self in front of that tank. Uh, what he was willing to do to defend his country, its sovereignty, its territorial integrity, its democracy. And it does beg the question, what are we willing to do to protect ours at home? Because while we're not threatened by Russian tanks, at least not directly, our democracy is nonetheless at grave risk. Uh, from a different but pernicious threat that comes from within. Uh, and what we're called upon to do is relatively so much less than what that Ukrainian man and what the Ukrainian people are called upon to do to defend their democracy. But it is, it is no less urgent uh, for us. Dr. Hill, I'm going to give you a chance with this question. Um, you can also 
weigh in on, on the previous question if you like, but I wanted to um, introduce it by pointing out you've written a book previously, Mr. Putin, that is somewhat of a psychological profile of the Russian president. Um, and you've served in multiple U.S. administrations. And the question is, uh, which presidents or which leaders here do you think best understand the Russian president? And, and separately, what do you believe is his underlying motivation for the invasion? And anything you want to um, add to the last question, I'm going to put in your hands. No, well, thank you. Um, this is working again, right? This one, yeah, yeah. great. Um, look, I, I completely share what uh, Congressman uh, Schiff uh, has just laid out in terms of analysis of where we are and you know how we got here. And uh, this is, in, in many respects, Vladimir Putin's war, because he sees himself, in many respects, as the embodiment of the Tsars, not of the uh, leaders of the, the Soviet state. He's not trying to reconstitute the Soviet Union, but he's literally got himself embroiled in history. And this is also dangerous. I mean, when you know that in our own democracy now we're having fights about history, basically what uh, Putin is engaged in is the ultimate cultural and history war. Because he's trying to tell Ukrainians that they're not citizens of their own country, but that they're subjects of the Russian Empire. The Russian Empire has been long gone. But nonetheless, this is uh, basically what Putin is trying to do, is to reverse that history and to go back to an earlier time. So this is actually literally a fight about history and culture, just as we're on the verge of engaging in ourselves. And you can also tell this by the choice of the negotiator that Putin sent to talk to the Ukrainians. I mean, you are obviously pretty well aware of this, that he picked Mr. Medzinski, the cultural minister. And people thought, well, that means he's not serious. No, it means he's deadly serious. Because Mr. Medzinski, who's actually born in Ukraine, but as thesis of himself as a great Russian, was also partly the ghostwriter of many of these essays that Putin has been writing about Russian history. And he's obviously intended to be negotiating history. Because as you mentioned before, Volodymyr Zelensky uh, is uh, something of um, an unexpected president in uh, Ukraine for so many different reasons. He's also Jewish and a Russian speaker. And basically Putin is trying to force on Ukraine a definition of what Ukraine is. That it's not Ukraine, that somebody with a diverse background can't be a Ukrainian citizen. Be like, you know, basically saying that only people here in Gaithersburg could be, you know, from one particular, you know, background. I mean, we all know that this, you know, is antithetical to the way that all of us live with multiple identities and multiple histories and creating something shared. And Putin is basically trying to impose on everybody, uh, you know, basically this, his version um, of the past and making it their future. And I do think that um, actually President Biden understands this better than most. And it's in part because, look, Putin has been in power now for 22 years. We always make jokes about President Biden's age, but there actually is something to be said from having been around for a long time and having seen Putin right from the inception uh, in, on the Senate uh, in a Foreign Relations Committee and as Vice President of having interacted with him. And part of um, you know, our problem in the United States, and um, you know, uh, Congressman Schiff already alluded to this, this idea of a deep state. We don't have a deep state. We have a rather thin state. We change over very frequently in our politics. Uh, not only do we, you know, hopefully, repeatedly change over our presidents through um, the whole full uh, proper process, but we then change over the national security advisors, the secretary of state, the secretary of defense, and then all the way down to the deputy assistant secretary level and many of the other people as well. Whereas Putin has stayed the same guy with the same group of people around him, and he's now become completely trapped in groupthink, his own version of events, and there's no diversity of thought and no one to push back against him. And in my interactions with President Biden, I can see that he gets that. The difficulty is, is exactly as Congressman Schiff said, Putin is dug in because he's fighting for his own sense of identity, his own version of Russian history, and there's nowhere for him to go. He can't give up on that. And we're going to have to contend with this for some time to come. We're all going to have to stay unified and on the same page together. And it's really worth it because, look, the Ukrainians are like us. Ukrainians would fit in, maybe there's some Ukrainians here in, in Gethersburg, but Ukrainians are citizens of their own country. They're diverse, they're from all kinds of background, there are Polish speakers, Lithuanians, Romanians, Hungarians, Crimean Tatars, you know, who were there before the Russians got there, Ukrainians of all different um, religious uh, persuasions, and they're just fighting to 
be part of the same polity, where, and they're fighting against somebody who wants to subjugate them. This is what you get when you give over everything to one man with no checks and balances. Can I just add, add one thing on? Just to add briefly uh, to what Dr. Hill said, uh, um, Putin, Putin has been wrong in so many of his pre-war calculations. But there is one pre-war calculation that has yet to be determined whether he's right or wrong. Uh, and that is Putin expects that Ukraine is far more important to him than it is to the United States, the West, or anyone else. Uh, and that he can essentially wear us down, wear the rest of the world down, wear down Europe, um, because this is of such vital significance to him. Uh, which means that the longer the conflict goes on, the more he can hope that the impact on Europe's economy, on our own economy, uh, that we will fatigue. That he can pick apart different European nations, that he can whittle down sanctions, that we will lose our focus and our interest. Uh, this is what he is counting on. Uh, and we have to make sure that he is wrong in that calculation too. Uh, that, that we have the staying power and the cohesion uh, for as long as this conflict takes uh, to support uh, Ukraine and what it's fighting for.